you need to know that uh, God is doing things in our church among the Persian community. If you don't know, we have a, a Farsi Bible study every Wednesday here with translation or interpretation. And uh, we have good times, I think. And this is Mojda. And Mojda is uh, Mojda and Dariush, who's out there somewhere. They help Andy and Jill and June and myself lead the group. So, Mojda, um, I think it was two Wednesdays ago you came to me and you said that uh, uh, you'd had a phone call to Iran and you were speaking to your sister in Iran. Uh, is she a Muslim? No, she's Christian. Uh, and Right, okay. And it was because your dad had a, a very bad... Very bad pain in his shoulder. Very bad pain in his shoulder. And because of that, what about his sleeping? He can't sleep anymore. Okay. So he had such a bad pain in his shoulder that he couldn't sleep. So what did you do? Uh, just me and my sister, we was pray for him. And my sister in Iran just touched him. And after five minutes, she told me she's sleeping and he's sleeping and uh, very calm and very relaxed. And uh, after that morning, I was calling him and he said, when you go to church, please pray for me. And now every night he told my sister, can you pray for me? And I need a sleep, a relax. And I'm very shocked because he's Muslim. He didn't say anything before, but now he said, can you pray, pray, pray for me every night, please? And I'm very, very happy. Okay. And uh, hold on. Yeah. And, and when Mojda phoned back the next day, uh, and she said, how's my father? What, what, what were you told? He said, I'm very good. If you go to church, please pray for me. And I'm, I'm very shocked because he didn't say anything before. But every time I said, can you come to cross? He said, not now. But I think a step by a step, maybe. And uh, the next day when she phoned, they said, how's, she said, how's my father? And he had slept all the way through the night. Amen. That's worth thanking Jesus for, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. And then, uh, was it uh, last Wednesday? I can't remember. You came to me? Yes, last Wednesday. Oh, last Wednesday. That's right. And uh, you, you said you were suffering from something. Uh, I have got very bad uh, high fever. Okay. Hay fever. Hay fever. And he was praying for me. And nighttime, everything is gone. Yeah. Wow. Come on. It took me 20 years to battle against hay fever before I got completely healed. We prayed for her a week ago, and she, she got healed straight away. Life is just not fair, is it? <laughs> Thank you, Muzha. Let's bless her. Yeah. I love testimonies like that. You know, um, we're, we're in the season of talking about freedom. And we've been doing that for several weeks, and I think we've got a few more weeks to go. So I want to continue with this same vein of talking to you about freedom. And uh, I want to talk to you about setting your mind on freedom. I believe that there is a, a tremendous key to victorious Christian living when we know how to deal with our minds. Um, I don't know about you, but one thing I'm learning is that I don't want to get ahead of myself, and I'm feeling so relaxed this morning. If I just kind of leave and go and get a sandwich or something like that, don't worry about it, okay? But um, I, uh, I have been battling quite recently and for some time with getting my mind free so there's no clutter in there. And I just want to thank God that he's been showing me how to do this. 
And what I want to share with you today, and I, 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 I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and impart this to us, is that you can actually live a life without a cluttered mind. You actually can. I know because it's happening to me. And there is nothing more wonderful, I find, in personal experience when I think about my mind, and it's not that there's a vacuum there, it's just peace. It's just peace. It's like there's no clutter. And, uh, and, and sometimes there's, there's no activity going on up here because I just feel at rest. And what I've noticed is that when I feel the clutter goes, then I know I'm in freedom. I'm free to hear from God. I'm free, free to listen to the Holy Spirit. I remember many years ago, a, a famous prophet chap, an American, he said, uh, and this is not my suggestion to you because I watch telly, I should be watching the Fedra match this afternoon. Uh, but he said, if I watch pictures from man, I don't get pictures from God. And for him, that was how he freed his mind up to receive things from the Lord. What happens to me is I watch television and I get pictures from God through the telly, especially, especially films. <laughs> Freedom! <Yeah. clears throat> uh, but uh, this morning, I just want to talk to you about how you can set your mind in order to walk in peace. You know, Jesus said in uh, John chapter 8, he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know that verse? And then a little bit later on in John chapter 8, he says, and whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. So I ask myself the question, is it the truth that sets you free, or is it Jesus who sets you free? Seems like a reasonable question, because it's there in John chapter 8. And the answer is very simple. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So both statements are exactly correct. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, and whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. And he is the truth. And so therefore he, who is the truth, is able to set us free. I was interested in the context of John chapter 8, and it was like he was talking to, I guess, the Pharisees, you know, the religious rulers of the day. And uh, they, they got very indignant with what Jesus had just said because he, he, it was basically, how dare you say that we are not free? We are the children of Abraham. We have never been slaves. Well, they, they forgot to read their Old Testament, didn't they? Because they were taken into slavery and off to Babylon for, was it 70 years? And... Prior to that, they were in Egypt for 400 years. They'd forgotten, these children of Abraham, that they spent a lot of time in slavery. But what Jesus said was this, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the implications on that is that they did not know the truth at that moment in time, and therefore they were not free. It is so important, dear brothers and sisters, that you and I know the truth, who is Jesus. Now, I know that probably everybody in this auditorium today could quote verses about Jesus, about how he is our Savior and our Lord, uh, King of Kings, uh, and many other things. And all of those things are, of course, of prime importance. But did you notice with me that Jesus said, you shall know the truth? If you look at Matthew chapter 7, 
Jesus, and I think the context was the judgment seat of God, Jesus said, and many will come before me saying, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do great signs and wonders in your name? But he said to them, you workers of iniquity, depart from me because I never knew you. Now he could have said your believing was real good. But he didn't say that. He said, I never knew you. And so what I want to say to you in this first part of the message this morning is it is so important that you and I know Jesus personally. Whatever you believe about him, which is great, necessary, tremendous, you need to know him. And to know him is to love him. It was a song like that, wasn't it, once? Yeah, can you sing it, Jill? Yeah? No. That's it, and I do, yeah. Second row, I've got it. And uh, it's so important that we know Jesus personally. Not so much about what we have done for him, but knowing him. Because to have a personal relationship with Jesus is to come into freedom. Amen? And I want to really major on that this morning. Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would come and transform our thinking, that we will receive truth, any clutter, that is in our minds right now, I just command it to go in the name of Jesus. And I pray that the sweet peace that Jesus gives us and Jesus leaves with us will be in our minds this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know, I love that song we were singing earlier. It's all right if I go all over the place, isn't it? I, I normally do. That song we were singing about, you know, uh, what was that song we were singing, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. This is how I fight my battles. That is so important that we should know how to fight our battles. And we do it through knowing Jesus. And I want to tell you, and I'll, I might go into this in a bit of detail later on, but I want to tell you, I, I have been through battles in my mind, in my life, and uh, I'm learning at long last that when you go through battles and you come out knowing that you have overcome, you receive an authority that you, you never had before. I, I am quite sure that some demon somewhere knew what I was speaking on today because this last night has been a battle. <laughs> and uh, I've been not exactly plagued, but I've been plagued with ungodly thoughts and bad dreams and everything in a most unusual way this last night. And uh, I want you to know this, that what I'm preaching to you today is really true because I didn't give in to any of it. I didn't give in to any of it. I, I got out of bed this morning saying, you didn't get me. I got you. You didn't get me. Because I kept my mind on godly things. But I know for a fact I've had to go through battles over sometimes many months to learn to overcome so that I can get to a place where I can actually use that authority. And I want to talk to you today about setting your mind on freedom, which will give you authority. Let's have a look at Romans chapter 8 together, shall we? If you've got your Bible, you want to turn to that. I want to read that to you. And uh, 
Thank God for hay fever that goes in a few hours. I love it. Wow. Pushka. Romans chapter 8 and uh, starting at verse 1 it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile for God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. I want you to notice two things here. And that is, it seems that Paul puts people into two different categories. One category is those who please the flesh and who are under the law of sin and death. And what do they reap from that? They reap death. And uh, there are those who live according to the law of the spirit of life, and uh, they reap life. And I want to teach you this morning how you and I can live under the law of the spirit of life and find freedom. Now, I don't know where you're at right now, uh, but I know one thing. And that is this, that if you're under the law of the spirit of life, you cancel out the law of sin and death. Did you know that? If you can learn to live under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of sin and death will have no dominion over you. Now, I'm not talking about whether a person has got saved or not. Because the one thing I know is, having been a Christian for many years, is that you can be free in so many areas, and yet there are some areas in your life where you still submit to the law of sin and death. Do you know what I mean? We can call it ungodly beliefs, we can call it habits, we can call it um, temptations that we give so easily into, whatever you want to call it. But... The fact of the matter is, God wants us to learn how to battle in these areas so that we can overcome whatever is negative within us and clutters up our minds. Jesus said this in one of the Gospels. He said, but I give you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. That's good news. I give you authority. He gave it, just like that, boom. And then he said, and you are going to overcome. That's a journey. I give you authority, boom, to overcome. That's a life experience, all the power of the enemy. So you've got authority. Turn to someone and say, I've got authority. And now your job is to learn to overcome having received authority so that you can overcome all the power of the enemy. And that means we have to do battle. We do have to do battle. Now, in verse 5 of what I've just read, it says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh 
And those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This is such an important truth here. Uh, you know, I'm not rushing this morning, okay? Uh, am I, I'm not going too fast, am I? Fine, good. Did you notice it said those who set their minds on the, on the spirit of life and those who set their minds on sin and death? And this tells me one thing, that you and I have got the power to set your minds on one or two of these laws. I love it when Jesus tells us we have authority to do something. I have the power, you have the power. So, that's another song. Where are these songs coming from today? Turn to somebody and say, I got the power. Yeah, that wasn't very good. <clears throat> you and I have the authority to set your mind either on the law of the spirit of sin and death, the law of sin and death, sorry, or the law of the spirit of life. You have the power to do that. Because it says, whosoever sets their mind on these things. So therefore, I have a choice, you have a choice. We can decide what I am going to set my mind on. So when the battles come, you have a choice. Do I set my mind on death or life? Because he's given you that ability. And that's good news, isn't it? That he's actually given it to you to choose what you do with your mind. I like that. I've been through so many things where I've gone from almost pleading with God to deliver me from something and getting out of bed in the middle of the night and casting demons out of my room and getting my sleep all disturbed. I might tell you a bit about that, I'm not sure. And I remember going through processes like that and coming to a place where I realized I have authority to set my mind on what I want. And I've noticed since then that authority comes during the night and early in the morning when I personally am most vulnerable. You're probably somebody who jumps out of bed and, you, let's get on with the day. I'm not like that at all. It takes me at least five and a half hours to wake up. And that's probably why I have my breakfast at three o'clock in the afternoon, but I don't know. <laughs> now, if you have a look at Romans chapter seven and verses 21 to 23, Paul there is talking about how he delights in God in his inner being, but he also sees a law in his members, the members of his body, that wants its own way. So he has this dilemma. In his mind, he delights in God, but his body does not follow suit. I don't know if any of you have that experience, maybe I'm the only one, but... Uh, some people argue that this is uh, Paul describing his pre-conversion experience. Well, I think he's describing Christian life. Don't you? Because before he became a Christian, even though he honored the law, he couldn't delight in it. For him, it was a schoolmaster that condemned him. There was nothing to delight in until he became a Christian and then it came to life and he started to delight in the law of God. And so in his mind, he's always delighting in the law of God. How many of you 
you know, you have those moments at home, you might be listening to a worship tape or you might be in the garden or what have you and you just get this real sense of, oh Lord, I really love you, you know? I remember when you prayed for me when I was in the garden. I, I mean, you prayed for me so I could get in the garden because I had hay fever. And you prayed, uh, Lord, take this hay fever away from Dave so he can sit in the garden and have a glass of wine. That's my daily habit now. No hay fever. Simon, do you remember praying for me every single jolly year? Yeah, and sometimes the hay fever would go after two days, three days, four days. And then one year, it didn't go at all after 20 years of suffering from it. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't understand this. What, what's going on here? I said, I, whenever I get prayed for, I get healed within hours. What, what's going on, Lord? He said, it's a spirit of infirmity. I said, oh, okay, I know what to do there then. So I went into my little studio and I said, spirit of infirmity, get off me now and never come back. I've never had a hay fever symptom since. <laughs> 20 years that took just to come to the place of seeing how prayer operated and how I was trying to get my mind believing in faith that if I got these guys to pray for me, it would go away. And then in the end, I had to come into my own authority. And I told that spirit to get lost. And I don't know if it got lost, but it certainly can't find my house. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. Where was I? I haven't got a clue. And so... Paul recognized there was a law in the members of his body that wages, wages war on his mind. And uh, when he gives into it, he, he capitulates. And it ends up in sin of some sort. And so here we have a situation where you can delight in the law of the Lord in your heart of hearts... Worship him, enjoy his presence and all the rest of it. Uh, and then you come across a situation where you know what is right to do and your body says, no. I don't want to do that. Anybody here understand what I'm talking about? Just one person nodding over there. Holy Spirit, we need you because there's a lot of liars in this place. <clears throat> And so therefore, when I know there's something good to do, immediately the law in the members of my body say, but I don't want to do that. I was wondering about just speaking to the men because I, I know what goes on in a man's mind. And I was going to tell you sisters not to listen. <laughs> and I thought their, their ears will prick up like crazy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you go downtown, fellas, and you see a very beautiful lady. And you go, wow. I'll put my hand up because you don't dare to put your hand up to say <laughs> that that ever happens to you. And I say, Lord, thank you so much. What beauty. And then my body says, look again. <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah, I can see written on your faces. It happens to you as well. And, and there is a process that carries on until you actually get into the sin of lust. And your mind has been captivated through your body and you sin in some way, either imagination or otherwise. And so, therefore, we have this war going on all the time. And we often give in to what our body is telling us. But in Romans chapter 8, it said we can set our minds upon the law of the spirit of life. You can set your mind on it. And so when this happens in Romans 7, where Paul says, I see a, another law in my body, waging warfare on the law of my mind to try and make me become a slave to whatever my body wants and I capitulate to it, then I sin. Now, this is, this is, this is the good bit, okay? 
I love it. I don't love it when I give in um, to whatever my the members of my body are trying to get me to do contrary to the law of God that is within me. But I want to tell you this, the law of the spirit of life is more powerful in you than the law of sin and death. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. If I fall short of the glory of God, and probably do every day, but in certain specifics, I, I let... The members of my body capture me and bring me into slavery. And then I feel, oh, what have I done? What's happened to me? I'm under the law of sin and death. And I feel condemnation. Any of you know what that means? Yeah, a few more people nodding now. You're getting a bit honest. What I've noticed is this, brothers and sisters. That in a situation like that, the law of the spirit of life kicks in immediately. Because it says to me, it says, David, deal with it. Go to God, repent, ask him to forgive you, ask him to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, favorite verse of mine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The law of the spirit of life within me tells me, get to God. Ask him to to forgive you. Repent. And ask him to wash away all the dirt that you have attracted by doing whatever you did. That's the law of the spirit of life. And do you know why the law of the spirit of life does that? Because the law of the spirit of life does not want me in condemnation. It wants me in freedom. And the law of the spirit of life says, I don't want you staying in that condemnation, David. You're a son of God. I want you in freedom. Therefore, get before God and get yourself sorted out. And I do. Hey, man. Isn't it good? You go from condemnation into feeling you're the holiest person in the world. (laughs) Anybody need any prayer? I'm your man. Have I done anything wrong this week? Uh, Can't remember. He doesn't, I can't. And so therefore the power of the law of the spirit of life kicks in immediately when the law of sin and death gets hold of you and brings you into freedom. And that is why it is so important, brothers and sisters, that we do what it said in Romans chapter 8, and we learn to set our minds upon the spirit, the law of the spirit of life. Because when you do, you stay in freedom. You live in freedom. You experience freedom. And when your members, the members of your body, not the members of the church, although that happens as well, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) try and upset you and stuff, you say, I I won't go down that road. I'm going to live under the law of the spirit of life. I'm going to live in a place where I experience the peace of Jesus in my mind and where I feel my mind is clean, where I feel my mind is free and there's no clutter I tell you, that's one of the most beautiful experiences I believe a Christian can have. No worry, no anxiousness, no sense of being tempted to sin in some way or other. And and you can do that. You can set your mind on that. Now, what I want to do now in this closing moment for the next hour and a half is, uh, (laughs) is to tell you how you can actually come into this in practice. Because I'm beginning to become an expert in this area. As I said, it's a journey. It's a battle. I remember, I won't go into details, but 
I remember after my wife died, uh, I had demons coming into my house and uh, they were looking for her and uh, they were trying to get to me. Uh, and their presence was very real. So I would get out of bed and I'd say, get out of my house. You're not welcome here. And they'd go. But it would happen over and over again. And then I got into the place where I prayed, Father God, give me a good night's sleep tonight. I just don't want that occurrence to happen anymore. Please just give me a good night's sleep. Lord, your word says, give me a good night's sleep because you give sleep to your beloved. And I used to pray over that for a long time. And it had, it had its, its, its purpose. It had its authority. It, you know, it, it, it did something. But then I noticed that as I did this, as a continual exercise of getting my mind set on the, the law of the spirit of life, something began to happen within me. And then what, what, what happened, which I've never experienced before, was that if, if there was a, 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 a demonic, um, what's the word, attack, Instead of me waking up and getting out of bed and telling the demons to go, I just stayed in bed, totally relaxed, and watched my spirit, as it were, almost come out of my body and chase those demons out of the house. And then my spirit came back to me. Now, don't ask me the theology of that. I haven't got a clue. Ask Frances. She's very good at that kind of thing. No, she's shaking her head. <coughs> And so I had a good night's sleep. My spirit had learnt to take over because I was battling with setting my mind on the law of the spirit of life. And my spirit was like, okay, I know what to do now. Leave these ones to me. Where I'm at at the moment is... Very simply this, that although that doesn't happen anymore, but many other things do, if I have a bad dream, how many of you have bad dreams? Yeah. If I have a bad dream, it could be frustration, fear, anger. It could be other things, which we won't mention, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, then... What I find now is that because I've been through the journey, I've been through the battle over weeks and weeks and weeks, I just simply wake up now and I say, Father, I don't like that dream. I'm not having that again. It doesn't come back. You see, if your mind is set upon the law of the spirit of life, you have an authority and uh, th th please don't get this wrong. I don't even pray in the name of Jesus for things like that. I just say, I will not have that, Father. Amen. And it doesn't come back. Or if I have a thought that is not the kind of thought that a, 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 a pastor or a man should have, then I, I just simply say to myself, I will not think like that, Father, in Jesus' name. And the thought goes and it doesn't come back. Because I've learned one thing, you can live in authority, your authority, when you have set your mind upon the law of the spirit of life. Amen? So I look at all the battles that I've been through, and I now realize God has brought me to the place in quite a few areas, not every area, but quite a few areas, where I just have to speak a word with my authority, the authority of, of a follower of Jesus Christ, and tell that thing, I will not let that into my life. And it goes. It doesn't come back. Oh, it might come back the next day. <laughs> and then I'll deal with it then. Same thing. Because the devil doesn't know when to give up. He goes around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. 
But I'll tell you what, he's very good at obedience to authority. And when he knows you have authority, he scarpers. Sorry, we're in the West Midlands. He runs away. <clears throat> if you submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. And the way he flees from you is when you have learned to set your mind upon the law of the spirit of life. You know you have authority, therefore you just speak the word. And you get immediate results. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is what I really want to bring you into today. If anything that I've said so far has... Uh, uh, affected you. I used to have dreams about frustration. How many of you have dreams about frustration? You can't, you can't remember where you put your car. You know, and, and you're dreaming this, okay? And you go, I know where it was, it's here. Oh, it's not here. Oh, okay. Well, it must be over here then. No, it's not there either. And, and you have this dream, which is frustration. Or you find your car, and then you can't find your keys. I remember waking up one morning and saying, Father, I've had enough of these frustrating dreams. There must be some frustration in me somewhere that the enemy is lock locking into. And he showed me a picture going back years when I was building aircraft simulators of someone who was speaking against me to the boss and telling my boss that I was no good. My boss hired me because he thought I was going to be the best. But this guy completely undermined me and put frustrations within me. And I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I forgive that man completely. And I repent of receiving that frustration. You know what? I very seldom have a dream like that anymore. And if I do, I just simply say, I'm not having that dream, Father. And it doesn't come back. Because I've learned how to overcome it. My dear brothers and sisters, there is nothing more wonderful than having a mind that is free. There's a verse somewhere. I wanted to look it up, but I can't remember where it was. But something like, blessed is the man whose mind is stayed on you. Is that the one? Yeah? Okay. You can have a mind that is stayed or is staying upon him. You can do that. And you can teach yourself to come to that place of authority where all you have to do is speak the word and the ungodliness, whatever it is, stops. Amen? Is that helpful to you this morning? Okay, I haven't tried to rush this because because I feel so relaxed. <laughs> but I, I want to pray for you. Would you like to stand? Now you will notice, maybe you didn't, but I haven't mentioned any specific sins today. Yeah, Simon says thank you. <laughs> and I felt the Lord say, don't go down that road, David. I said, why Lord? I didn't particularly want to in any case. They always come and backfire on you, don't they? <laughs> but the Lord says, people know what goes on in their minds. You don't need to tell them. You don't need to try and get some sort of manly conviction. They know what happens in their minds, what they think about, what they concentrate on, what they set their minds on in terms of the law of sin and death. You don't need to tell them. They know that. All you need to tell them is they can be free. You can be free in Jesus' name if you learn to set your mind on the law of the spirit of life. And the law of the spirit of life is in you and sets you free. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these wonderful, lovely brothers and sisters. And I thank you, Lord, that you don't want any single one of us to have condemnation. Because there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And therefore, Lord, I want to pray for the law of the spirit of life to become so active in every one of our lives that we will know how to set our minds on that and receive an authority to say no because the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And so, Lord, we just pray, come now, Holy Spirit, just show us if there's any clutter in our minds so that we can just wash it away. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I give all my clutter to you. I want a mind that is free. I submit my mind to you. I resist the enemy. And I say to him, be gone. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Now, Jesus, you said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So I pray that the peace of Jesus will come upon you right now, upon your minds, in Jesus' name. And that he will not only put his peace on you in an ever-increasing way, but he will leave it with you. <laughs> Jesus, you're the Prince of Peace. Oh, wow. Can't you feel him? Ha <laughs> ha, wow. Come and do it right now, Jesus. Across all these chairs where people are standing, just, just put your peace on them. Thank you that you cannot deny your own name. You're the Prince of Peace. Let peace come. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wow. Hmm. Teach us the truth. Let us know you, Jesus, so that we are free and not in slavery to anything. Completely free. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you like that, then just bless the Lord. Mm -hmm.